Amen. You can be seated. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn in it with me to Matthew chapter 2, starting off in verse 13 and reading all the way to verse 23, the end of the chapter. This will conclude our little uh, Christmas sort of mini-series on Matthew 1-2. to I believe that next week we'll get back into 1 Samuel. But um, this has been fun. It's been a fun little, uh, little four-message series. And uh, we'll be covering really the whole second half of uh, chapter 2 of Matthew uh, today. And I was going to mention that the title of my message is A Hunted Messiah or A Hunted Savior. It probably would have been more accurate to entitle it A Foreshadowed Messiah or A Foreshadowed Savior. But with Christmas this, uh, this week, I kind of got my message titled before Christmas and uh, turned it in to Patty for the bulletin. And then it was uh, the holiday came and, and it kind of uh, just threw everything off for me. So in any event, we're talking about Jesus as being hunted by Herod, his being also um, foreshadowed by many other things throughout the Old Testament. And uh, you'll understand that as we look in our text. And I have to confess to you that this is going to be, uh, it's going to maybe feel again like more of a Bible study than a sermon, perhaps. And I don't mean that purposefully. It's just that some passages, there's really a lot to deal with. And so there's a lot of, sometimes it's a lot of content to, uh, to work through. And so I pray that you're blessed by it anyway, even if it doesn't necessarily feel like a traditional message. But Matthew 2, 13 to 23, I'm going to read it. And then we'll talk about it for a little while. 2.13. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. It's from Hosea. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem And in all its districts, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. And then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's the word of the Lord for us today. Every paragraph that Matthew has written so far has been anchored in either Old Testament history or some kind of Old Testament passage longing for fulfillment that finds its fulfillment in Jesus. If you examine the first two chapters of Matthew, every single paragraph uh, has something about the Old Testament there. He's anchoring Jesus' identity in the Old Testament. We tend to think about these two chapters um, as being really about Christmas, and uh, really we can think of them like that because I'm sort of dealing with them in sort of this little Christmas series that I'm doing, this little mini-series around Christmas. But really... We should probably think about this more in terms of being kind of the the summary sequence at the beginning of like a movie sequel where it shows like the the backstory so that you can understand the actual movie that you're about to watch. That's what Matthew is doing here. He is taking the backstory and he is giving what's, he's giving all the information that you've got to understand so that you can understand who this Jesus is, who he is about to tell you about. And this is why I love it so much. It's why I just, I love so much about it because if you know me, you know that I just cannot get enough of Jesus. I can't get enough of talking about Jesus. I just think he's so wonderful and so glorious and so magnificent and majestic that it just gets my heart beating hard to think about who he is and to think about 
his work that he's come to do. And really, you have to understand the Old Testament if you would understand who this Jesus is. Seeing what the Old Testament says about him is heartburning, I would say. Not in the kind of like post-Christmas uh, meal sense of heartburning, but in the sense of Luke 24, right? Where uh, the disciples hear Jesus tell them who he is from the Old Testament, and it says that their hearts burned within them as he made them as he explained to them the scriptures concerning himself the old testament is inspired redemptive history meaning that it doesn't include all that could be said but it does include all that god wanted to say because he wants us to know certain things and the first pages of the new testament here the first couple of chapters of matthew are written in such a way so that you would see the unity of the story surrounding Jesus. Let's be clear, there is diversity in the Bible, isn't there? The Old Covenant is different than the New Covenant. The Old Testament is different than the New Testament. There's all kinds of uh, genres to the scripture. Writers are different and all of that. Yet, nevertheless, there is a, a startling unity to the story. There's a startling unity to the whole Bible if you understand it as revealing who Jesus is, if you understand it as ultimately being about him. And the whole point of seeing the unity of the story in Christ is so that you would see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Just like Paul said that that's what happens when a person is converted. They come to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Um, it's 2 Corinthians 4, as the one who is the God-man who fulfills both sides of the covenant. So he's both God and he's man. And being an obedient man to God's command, he fulfills both sides of the covenant. So... Christianity is, is Christ-centered. It's totally focused on him. And the gospel writers want you to understand this. And Matthew is, uh, is really doing the same thing here, helping you to understand how everything was leading to him so that you would fix your eyes on him and not only believe in him, but rejoice in him and rest in him. Here I want to argue today that Matthew pulls together the contours of the Old Testament in Jesus in three ways. So he takes all the contours of the Old Testament and he sort of wraps them together and he connects them to Jesus, I think, in three ways in our passage today. First, he does this by paralleling Jesus with Moses as a hunted Messiah. Paralleling Jesus with Moses as a hunted Messiah. You probably remember that uh, back in Moses' day when he was first born, Israel's firstborn were hunted by a mean Pharaoh. Pharaoh was trying to uh, practice population control throughout Egypt, and so what does he do? He says, let's kill all of, all of the firstborn of the Israelites, of the slaves here in Egypt. And Moses is one of them. And so he was able to escape because he had a smart mother and a smart sister. And so they put him in this basket and they float him down the river. And, and eventually Moses is able to survive. But nevertheless, uh, it was the firstborn of all the Israelites who were slaughtered except for him there in Egypt. We talked about at Christmas Eve how Herod, uh, the king, feared that this king of the Jews, as the Magi referred to Jesus in verse 2 earlier in the chapter, feared that his being born the king of the Jews would then somehow make him himself obsolete. And so he had to set out himself to exterminate this baby as well. A lot of similarities here to Moses. And so he tells the Magi, which this is what we talked about at Christmas Eve service, and I know most of you don't know that because a lot of us, uh, a lot of a lot of you weren't here for Christmas Eve service. It was a small number, but, and that's, that's just fine. But just as a backstory, the, um, the Magi, uh, Pharaoh, or not Pharaoh, but Herod sends the Magi to Bethlehem to find out if that's indeed where the child has been born. And then he says, come back to me and tell me if he is indeed born there so that I can go worship him. But you know that that's not really what Herod was after. He wanted to go there to kill the child. So the Magi, they escape a different way to go back to where they came from, and Herod is just furious. He's livid. And so he sets out, and he does the exact same thing. He calls for the exact same thing that Pharaoh in Egypt called for, and that is the killing of all of the firstborn throughout Israel. That's what happens there in verse 16. Set out to put to death all the male children, I should say that, not necessarily firstborn, but all the male children in Bethlehem and all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he determined from the wise men. 
And so Jesus' parents take him to Egypt to help him to escape from this. And we know this, one thing about Herod that you should understand. This is not just some kind of one-off event. Herod is a very, very cruel, cruel king, cruel tyrant. In fact, um, there was apparently, I learned this this past week, I never knew this before, there was apparently a drowning accident where a high priest died in a drowning accident, a high priest who Herod wasn't too fond of. Uh, The problem was that the drowning accident only occurred in about two feet of water, something like that. And so it's likely, uh, the story goes, that Herod sent somebody to kill this priest who he was mad at. It gets better. Herod also had one of his wives strangled. Herod also had three of his sons killed. And that prompted a phrase that was apparently known in the ancient world, better to be one of Herod's pigs than one of Herod's sons. Cruel, cruel king. Repulsive to us, or at least it should be, uh, to kill babies exactly the way that Herod has done here. But keep in mind, Deuteronomy 18 says that when the prophet comes into the world, when it's talking about the Messiah, he's going to be a prophet like Moses. And so Matthew is showing us here that in Jesus' birth, um, he is a lot like Moses. He's a lot like him. He's starting off exactly like Moses in the fact that he's got a bounty on his little baby head, basically, the same way that Moses did to some degree. That's why in the next chapter, he's going to be baptized, which is sort of like Moses passing through the water at Exodus. The next chapter, he's going to be tempted in the wilderness, like Moses and Israel in the wilderness. The next chapter in the Sermon on the Mount, he stands up on a mountain and he preaches the word of God the same way that Moses did to the people of Israel. Again, just to show all of these ways that Jesus is like Moses. So that the readers, especially Jewish people who would be reading this gospel, might say, in the same way that we know that God spoke by Moses, apparently God is speaking again. And he's going to be speaking to us through this one, through this Messiah figure. He's the prophet. And not only does God speak through him, but he's the one who has come to make God fully known to us. So that whereas Moses spoke to us the word of God, and it was wonderful what God had to say through him, yet Yet now we know who this God is truly and fully because of what this one is going to say. That's, that's the sense that you get throughout the Gospels. When you read about who God is in Jesus, it's like, ah, now everything makes sense. Everything is clear. Now we know truly who he is. And I think that that's why, that's why when Jesus uh, turns the water into wine at that one wedding, um, the guy says to the master of the feast, You know, most people, they serve the good wine first and they save the worst for the end, but you have chosen the good wine for the end. And the point there is that whereas God had much wonderful for the people of God for forever leading up to that time, yet Jesus is the one who comes and brings all of the very best that God has for his people. But you've got to, in order to understand that, you first have to understand that he's speaking through Jesus in the same way, or at least in similar ways, that he spoke through Moses in the earlier time. So that's what Matthew's doing. He's wanting to parallel Jesus with Moses and therefore draw all the Old Testament together in him. Secondly, he wants to parallel Jesus with Israel as God's son. Parallel Jesus with Israel as God's son. We see this in particular in verses 14 and 15. So there are a lot of parallels that we could could draw here between Jesus and Israel, but I just want to draw your attention to what it says there in verse 15. When it says that Jesus was taken to Egypt, this happened so that it might be fulfilled, verse 15, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Now there's something interesting here. Because if you read Hosea, in the context, it's talking about Israel as the son of God. It's talking about Israel there because uh, you remember God saying to a Pharaoh, let my people go, let my son go. In Exodus 4.23, he calls Israel his son there. And so Hosea seems to be saying that Israel is the son of God. And that seems to be what he's talking about. And yet Matthew here takes that passage and he applies it to Jesus. If you were to read some, uh, some Bible critics and people who think that there are problems between the Old and New Testaments, you would find the argument that Matthew does damage to Hosea's uh, account by taking it and applying it in a way that Hosea didn't originally mean it. And so we might, might be a little bit shocked to, to hear that, that people would think that there's some kind of discrepancy between the Testaments. But the reality is it's likely that all that Matthew is doing 
he is, he's reading what the prophet Isaiah does in Isaiah 42 to 53, where he identifies the Messiah with the nation. That is to say that the, ser- the servant, the suffering servant represents the nation, represents the people, and he is making that programmatic for how he reads the whole of the Old Testament. And therefore, this promise that originally referred to Israel as a nation, now it actually refers to Jesus because he represents the nation. He's the one who is the true son of God. And I I just, I think that's the only way that we can really make sense of what Matthew is doing here. Because in the original, again, it does refer to to Israel as the son. But Matthew is saying, actually, it refers to this son now. This one who is the true and eternal son of God. So... What do we find here? He goes to Egypt, just like Israel did with Jacob and his family. He escapes from Egypt, just like Israel would eventually 400 years later. All the babies are killed um, there around Bethlehem in the exact same way that the firstborn babies in Egypt among the Israelites were killed. And then finally, in our passage here, he is going to return the people of God from exile. That's the point of the quote in verse 18 from Jeremiah 31. If you look there, in Jeremiah 31, 15, about the lamentation, the weeping, the great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted. In context, that's a passage that is weeping because of exile, but the next section in Jeremiah refers to a return from exile, where it's a new kind of exodus. And remember we talked about in the genealogy a couple weeks ago, Matthew doesn't assume that Israel has come back out of exile yet. Why? because Jesus is the one who brings the people back out of exile. He brings them in the true and better exodus into the presence of God, into his glorious grace. That's what Matthew is saying here. The whole of the Old Testament story of God's deliverance of the people through the exodus, eventually into the land, back out into exile, then back into through a new exodus, this is all coming together in the person and work of Jesus as the one who ultimately fulfills this idea of sonship. That's the point, again, as I said a few weeks ago, of the genealogy showing that Jesus is the one, Jesus is the one through to whom all things are pointing, and he's the seed of Abraham. People born from Abraham's, in Abraham's lineage, are they, are they actually the seed of Abraham? Of course, Israel's Abraham's seed. But ultimately, Jesus is the one to whom these things point. And so when Jesus, remember when he's talking with the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman, and he tells her that salvation is from the Jews, he meant it. His point was that Israel, from these people, comes the Savior. And that's me. I'm the Messiah, he's saying. I'm the one who brings this salvation, but I've come from Judaism. Remember Robert Walter here a a little over a month ago now, I think, Uh, saying that Jesus was not only a Jewish Messiah, but I would argue he said that Jesus actually is Jewish today at the Father's right hand. And I had never thought about it before, but I think he's exactly right. He is a Jewish Messiah who has come to bring about the, the salvation of Israel that can then go out to the world as well and save everybody, because everybody can get in on this. And I guess if there's a practical point here, it's this. It's important for us to recognize the sources of God's blessing us, right? It's important for us to recognize that if we have been blessed, if we have received good things, to recognize the sources from which we got those things. So you have food on your table on on Christmas day and you ate a nice feast, where'd you get the food from? Be thankful for that place, that store. Uh, You have a job that you appreciate, that you love to do, be thankful um, for the training that you got. That you, where you got the training to do that job. I mean, it's just important for us to not only give thanks to the Lord, but to also be thankful to the sources through whom God has served us and blessed us. And it's the same thing with uh, what's going on right here. Yeah, Jesus is the Savior of the world, but there is a, there's a past, isn't there? There's a whole nation, the people of Israel, from whom he came. And Matthew wants us to, to recognize that and to just understand that that things have been happening leading up to this. It's interesting if you study theology throughout, uh, throughout church history, I would argue that Protestant theology has not been very nice to Israel uh, in many ways. Uh, the, the Jewish people have, have not really been, have not really been uh, treated very fairly in historic theology and more kind of a recent maybe dispensational versions of, uh, of, of 
you know, biblical theology, I think one of the things that they've done well is bring back into people's minds how important Israel is in the story. That's exactly what Matthew is getting at here. Israel's very important in the story, so crucially important that Jesus came from them. You can go too far with this and have sort of an Israel-centered view of Scripture and even of history, and that is incorrect because it's about Jesus, not about them, and quite frankly, not about us either as the, as the church. It's ultimately about him, but let's at the very least be thankful for the sources that God has used to bless us and to serve us in the same way that Matthew is saying here that Jesus came from Israel, and let's recognize that story. Thirdly, and finally here, Matthew wants to parallel Jesus with the Nazarites, with the Nazarites. You see this in verses 19 uh, to 23, and this one's a little bit strange, I know. Uh, sometimes I have strange points in my sermons, and you're always very patient with me in that, but this, this one's a little bit strange, but I think that it's, it's in the text here, and just let me, let me make this argument. So verse 19, Herod dies, this is 4 BC, we're pretty sure that's when Herod died. And then Joseph takes the family back to Israel, um, exactly like he's told to there in verse 21, verse 20 and 21. He then finds out that uh, Archelaus is ruling. And by the way, if um, you were praying for a worse ruler to replace Herod, the Lord would have answered your prayer because Archelaus is a terrible, terrible ruler, so horrible that eventually Rome was going to depose him and banish him to Gaul. And you had a lot of terrible rulers throughout the Roman Empire, terrible Caesars, and yet this one right here was bad enough that they said, oh man, you're pretty, you're pretty bad. We've got to banish you. That's what happened to Archelaus. So Joseph is afraid to take him back into the land of Israel to the, to the central region from which he came. And instead in verse 22, he decides to take him into Galilee, generally, and into Nazareth in particular, to fulfill this promise that he was going to be a Nazarene. Now, let me say this. Later on, there would be problems that people would have with Jesus because he was from Galilee and from Nazareth, because they, they understood that the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem, just like the scriptures promised and like we saw on Christmas Eve. And so they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? You know, that's what one of the disciples said. And why would the Messiah come from that redneck region known as Galilee? That's basically what it was regarded as, a redneck region. Type of place like where I grew up, essentially. Why would, anybody, why would the Messiah come from there, uh, they would say. They understood he was supposed to come from Bethlehem. But I think that's why Matthew is writing the way that he's writing with all of these details. Because he wants to show people he indeed was born in Bethlehem like the prophet said. But he was chased all around the world basically. Until eventually he ended up in Galilee and in Nazareth. Just to show that God is the one who has protected him cared for him and made sure that this baby who the world's evil was trying to destroy almost from day one would be safe so that he would fulfill the call that God had on his life. One note maybe, maybe of practical, uh, of practical uh, a point I guess for us today would be that whereas our journey might look generally the same as other believers and other saints throughout history, and indeed it does. It's sort of a pilgrim's path that looks a lot like the uh, followers of, of God in Scripture. It looks a lot like uh, the story in Pilgrim's Progress. Yet at the same time, the details of all of our journeys are different, aren't they? We kind of all have our own salvation to work out with fear and trembling, right? And so when the scripture says to imitate those who shared the word with you, yeah, we should imitate them, but we shouldn't think that our, that our journey is going to look the exact same as those who shared the word with us. But rather, ultimately, we understand that God's the one who's in control of the details in our lives. And we, we do have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Everybody has a different journey, even though generally it's, it's the same as every other believer, particularly it's as unique to you as your fingerprint is. Your journey's different. The important thing is you following Christ, you following the Lord's leading, and you trusting in his providence. God was in control of the details here of Jesus being protected. He's in control of the details in your life as well. 
it's important for us to have that in mind, to keep that in mind, that whatever's going on in our lives, whatever trials or difficulty or darkness that we're going through, yet the Lord is the one who's in control. He's the one who is seeing us through. He's the one who, like he protected his son when he was a baby, is protecting us as well, keeping us for what he has for us. Well, furthermore, as, uh, as we move to the end of there, verse 23, when it talks about him being born, or not being born, but being raised in Nazareth, fulfilling what was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. You look at that, and you might think it's a little bit strange, and uh, you should think that, because Matthew doesn't seem to have, well, let me say this, the commentaries don't, uh, don't think, most of them, that Matthew has one scripture in particular when he quotes this. And so there are a lot of different explanations for what he means about this kind of Nazarene fulfillment. What's he talking about there? Some people think that it's kind of a general uh, teaching of the prophets that the Messiah would be like a Nazarite. Uh, some think that it has something to do with the word for branch. Uh, so he's the branch of David. The word for branch in Hebrew is something like Nestorith, which sounds a lot like this. I think it's a little more simple. I think it's a little more simple, and I think that my new King James that uses an old reference system is onto something when it connects that verse, verse 23, with Judges 13.5, when it says that Samson is going to be a Nazarite. And if you look in that passage, you find that Samson's going to take a Nazarite vow, which means that he is going to be um, somewhat set apart. He's going to have his, his head shaved for a time, just like all the other Nazarites would. He would be holy and set apart like other Nazarites to serve the Lord and do it in a special way that the other people in the nation don't. That's what a Nazarite was. And it seems like Matthew is taking that little statement about Samson's call to be a Nazarite, and he's saying that ultimately it is supposed to be connected to Jesus, who himself was also like one of those men taking a Nazarite vow, set apart for God's purposes and God's service. And I would argue that the point here is that whereas the Nazarites were the set apart holiest of the holy people of God in the Old Testament, Jesus is the one ultimately to whom that points to. And he comes into the world as the savior to not only be set apart in that same way, but to then open that up and share that with other people who believe in him as well. Meaning that not only is holiness and uh, being set apart for special service to God um, annexed to the Nazarites, but now it belongs to all of those who belong to the true Nazarite, the living Christ, to whom the office of Nazarene in the Old Testament pointed. And it's just interesting to me how that was the point of him being raised in Nazareth, is, to, is so that those who would sort of examine the details would see that there is a parallel between Nazareth in the Old Testament and Jesus the Nazarene in the New Testament. That's why in the book of Acts, and I can't remember the exact passage, but it says that the church was called the sect of the Nazarenes at one point. The reason being that Jesus was born in Nazareth to show that he is the true Nazarite, and then he shares that with people who come to him and trust in him. They then become Nazarites. They then become set apart. They then become a, the people of God who are truly distinct from the world around them. Not in a way that they are totally unlike the world around them, because then you wouldn't be able to shine your light to people around you, but in a sense that you are set apart for different purposes and for a different calling. That is to belong to the Lord and to serve Him. I guess, I guess kind of the big point here is that He takes the devotion of the Old Testament Nazarites they're being dedicated to God's purposes and God's service, and then fulfills that office himself, and then he opens that up to all of those who come to him, so that they become Nazarites to some degree as well, and he puts it into their hearts. That's why when you turn to the Sermon on the Mount a few chapters later, what you find is Jesus taking the law of God and driving it into the hearts of those whom he's speaking to, right? He tells them, you've heard it said, don't murder. I say that if you have a hateful attitude in your heart, same thing as, same thing as murder in God's eyes. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. 
I tell you that if you have a lustful attitude, you've already committed adultery. What's he doing? He's taking the law that's outward and he's driving it into people's hearts because those who know him aren't supposed to just, aren't supposed to just take the commands of God um, and just think that they're outward, but, but those who know him are those who are supposed to have the law of God written on their hearts, like Jeremiah 31 says, and like that promises. Again, you know, just the, the main point is that when you become a believer, you become a believer in Jesus in the same way that a Nazarite becomes a Nazarite. Set apart and obviously so. When you come to Christ, you're set apart too. I don't think this means that literally we should all shave our heads like the Nazarites in the Old Testament. In fact, women, please don't. Um, but it does mean that there is supposed to be a clear distinction between those of us who come to this Jesus and those who haven't. That's the point. He's taken this, he's taken this Nazarite devotion and he has driven it, he's driven it to its conclusion and then he calls those who would want to follow him to that same kind of life of devotion and commitment to the things of God and to God himself. He's looking for transformation from the inside out not from the outside in. Now let me, let me uh, just kind of give one general application here today uh, by way of conclusion. It's this. You hear people talk all the time today about justice, don't you? People talk all the time about justice and the need for there to be justice in the world and fairness and all of that. The problem is a lot of the times it is poorly defined what people mean by justice. And if you sort of probe a little bit and ask questions, usually people aren't talking about justice. They're talking about some kind of reverse of the injustices in the past that then favor maybe those who have been unjustly treated in the past so that they can then treat other people unjustly as well. And what's that? That's partiality. And what do we know about God and partiality in the scripture? With God, there is no partiality, right? So it's not actually justice. It's not actually, it's not actually fairness. But the point is that people seem to think, and this is really what is kind of the mindset behind liberal Christianity, and it's the mindset that's just out there in culture right now. People seem to think that if you can change the outward circumstances, that that's going to change people's inward countenance as well. The thing is, outward circumstances should be good. We should be working for true justice. Don't mishear me. Of course, we, we should be working for true justice. The problem is, transformation of outward circumstances doesn't actually affect the heart. It doesn't actually change people's hearts. What Jesus came to do is to transform people from the inside out. He came to transform them by taking out their heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh. He came to make them new. And that's not by changing things outwardly. It's by transforming them inwardly, by taking the truth of God and confronting people, lovingly looking them in the eye and telling them, you don't need me to be a military and political ruler to free you from Rome's oppression. What you need is to see that I'm the Lamb of God without blemish or spot who takes away the sins of the world. You need to be born again. You need the Lord to do a work in your heart whereby you are done with yourself and you're ready for God to do a work in you that only He can do. I mean, that's, that's what this is getting at when it's talking about Him being a Nazarene him taking this Nazarite vow, he's saying, I'm after changing your heart, changing your whole spirit, your whole countenance from the inside out. Outward circumstances, sometimes things are good, sometimes things are bad. Some years are happy, some years are not happy. Let's be honest, right? 2020 was not a very happy year for a whole lot of us, for most of us, I would say. It's outward. Things come and go, things are, things are up and down in this world. But Jesus is after people having a transformation from the inside out. And that's why when he was preaching uh, in the uh, Nazareth synagogue the one time, 
uh, when he stands up and he reads from Isaiah 61. There in Luke 4, he stands up and he reads from the Isaiah scroll, and it's a passage about liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and, and freedom for all of, the oppressor, all of the oppressed and all of that. You know what he said afterward? He didn't say, therefore, I have come to bring about outward justice all throughout Israel and all throughout the world from here on out. No, he stood up after, after he read that, he looked to the crowd and he said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Meaning, whatever's going on outside, I'm proclaiming the real liberty. I'm proclaiming the real freedom to those who are captive. I'm proclaiming the real setting free of those who are oppressed. The point is, it starts in the heart. And you who have heard that I'm the Messiah, you who have heard that I have come to liberate all things that are oppressed in the world, the fact that you've heard that I'm the one, you can start where the real heart of the problem lies. That's in the heart. What you need is to be put into a state of reconciliation with God. And that's exactly what I've come to do. I deal with that first, and then we'll deal with the other stuff second. The other stuff will get dealt with. In this world, there will always be injustice. There will always be unfairness. Again, believers should be those who are standing up for real, true, biblically defined justice. But we also should be honest about the fact that in this world, there will always be trouble, won't there? And ultimately, our first motive, our first call should be preaching the Jesus who wants to transform people from the inside out, who wants to make a people who are like him, real Nazarites who are set apart. Again, as I said already before, when you become a Christian, you become a Christian in the sense that Samson was a Nazarite. There is no half-committed Christianity, is there? It's either all or nothing. And I think that a lot of people sort of go through a journey in their faith where maybe they are sort of half committed for a while, <clears throat> excuse me. But in time, over the course of time, they learn. Jesus calls me to take up my cross. He calls me to get real. He calls me to get serious. He calls me to, to, to go further with him and to live like a truly set apart Nazarite, just like those were in the Old Testament. That's the whole reason why he came. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he rose from the dead, is so that he would have a people who come to him and rise from the dead as well. And it only happens, it only happens when you understand who this, who this Jesus is. Matthew has really done us a service here by showing us who Jesus is in, in his Old Testament identity, his Old Testament context, showing how everything is meant to sort of be funneled toward him and to find its focus and its fulfillment in him so that you will see that if all history leads to and flows from Jesus, your whole life, your whole existence, and your whole identity is meant to lead to and flow from him as well. And my hope and my prayer for you today would be that you would have that on your heart as you enter into a new year. As it turns to 2021 here in just a few days, a couple of days, it's the 27th now, as it changes, as the year changes in a few days, that is unless the Lord returns, how can you get closer to Jesus in this next year? And, and can I make a suggestion? If one attempt on your part is going to be to try to read through the Bible in a year, uh, it's not a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. Sometimes that can be a good thing. Um, but maybe if, you've not, maybe if you've not ever like read large chunks of Scripture at once, it might be a little bit too daunting because a lot of times people will start with Genesis and it's riveting and it's easy to follow. They get through Exodus. That's pretty riveting and easy to follow too, except for some sections. And then they get into Leviticus and pretty soon their, their New Year's resolution is, uh, is going kaput, basically. It's hard to do it. I mean, it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with Leviticus. It's wonderful. It's just hard to read through if you don't really do it often. If you want to get closer to Jesus, I would, I, I would suggest 
picking a gospel, picking one of the gospel accounts, um, maybe Gospel of John, maybe something like the Gospel of Mark or something like that, and committing to reading through it um, as much as you can, as often as you can, maybe every day, not necessarily a chapter a day, but as much as you possibly, as much as you could every day thinking about what you're reading. Because that's another thing, when you like do reading plans where you plan to get through you know, a whole book within like a week or something like that, you know what happens, sometimes you start reading it and then you, 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 know, you, you read through a lot of it but you don't actually take in a lot of what you're reading. Instead, you know, pick something and go slowly. Go slowly, write things down, spend time in prayer, uh, after you read, maybe even before you read as well, you can never go wrong making plans to go further with Jesus, starting with the scriptures, right? And taking this gift that's been given to us in his word. And I, I think that I can, I think I can promise you that if you say to the Lord, okay, this new year's coming in, there are a lot of things that I might hope what happened in the new year, but I don't know what's going to happen outwardly. So Lord, I'm just going to work on what's going on between me and you and my, between my heart and your heart. So what I'm going to do is read through a gospel. Every day I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to ask questions of it. Uh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to use resources maybe to find answers to the questions that I have. And I'm going to commit this to you, Lord, for you to take me further with you. If you do that, I think I can promise you he's going to meet you there. Because he has, he's himself the living word. If this is the written word, Jesus Christ himself is the living word. And if you're reading this, you're actually hearing from him, listening to him. But whatever it looks like for you in the next year, you know, we've got our own journey to deal with. We've got our own salvation to work out. If you're going to make a New Year's resolution, let it include going deeper with Jesus. Let it include developing, growing in him. And just watch, watch what will happen with the rest of your life. All the other details in your life is you're focused on the one on whom your focus is supposed to be set. And the promise is that he will take you, he will care for you, and his concern and his care that he has for you now will not only continue, but you will find a heightened and increased awareness of it within yourself. You're going to know that he loves you, that he cares for you, and that he's there for you, and that he's working together all things for your good. That's one of the, one of the great things about the Christian life, one of the great um, sort of, I guess, developments, is that as you take steps toward him, what you find is that he becomes more and more believable. We don't see him with our eyes. We don't, do we? We don't see him. Sometimes we wonder if he's there. Sometimes, like David in the Psalms, we feel like maybe he's abandoned us, perhaps. We've all been there, I think. And yet, as you grow, as you journey with him, you find yourself more and more believing these things. You're more and more convinced that these things are true. And truly, you're more and more convinced that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the question, though, for us today, and I think it's the question all day, it, you know, all days, is whether or not we will simply continue to journey, take steps toward him, and commit our ways to him. The promise is, like we just sang a few minutes ago, since he is our savior and since he is our shepherd, he will lead us. So let's commit to that, both collectively as a church, and let's commit to that individually as disciples in the next year. And let's pray to start that off. So Lord, today as we uh, consider your being our great shepherd, our great high priest, indeed as we consider you as the true and better Moses, as the true Son of God to whom Israel points, and ultimately as the true Nazarite who has committed himself to his Father's calling so that we would come to you and become Nazarites as well, set apart and following you. We pray, Lord, that you would bring us into the new year in such a way 
that we would be growing in you, that the Holy Spirit would be taking these things that we know are true, that we know are right, and that we know are real, and applying them to our hearts, warming us to your love and care for us, and helping us, O oh Lord, to grow and to develop as disciples. Indeed, that's what we find when we look at the scriptures. The whole point of all of this is so that we would be conformed into your perfect and glorious image. That's why you came. So Lord, let that be the case. I pray that we would look back on this year uh, which we are leaving and that we would be thankful for all the lessons that we've learned, even that we would be thankful for all the trials and all of the difficulties because we know that they are purposeful in Christ. We know that you are the one who are working out your perfect plan in our lives, molding us, shaping us, preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all compare. And until then, we are being renewed day by day. Though our outer self wastes away, yet the inner self is being renewed day by day. Lord, put that truth on the forefront of our minds. And let that be the lens through which we judge and discern everything that's happening around us and in us. That Jesus is bringing about a new creation. He's working for it today, preparing a place for us even as we speak. And also preparing us for it. So Lord, may we, may we simply enter the new year as people with a heightened awareness of your shepherding us and caring for us maybe even more than in the previous year. And whatever you have for us, Lord, we'll be thankful because it all belongs to you, as do we. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.